Good morning. Would you please stand with us? Father, we are thankful that we are in this place this morning. God, we pray that your spirit would just move in the hearts and the minds of people. God, that we would humble ourselves before you, God, and that we would lay aside any distractions that we have, God, that we might focus on you. God, we lift our voices up to you. We lift our eyes up to you, God, and we bow our hearts. In your name. God this morning. 
whatever it is that's going on in our life, whatever heartache it is that we have deep inside, His Spirit that lives inside of us is there to comfort us. He's there to give us the power and the strength to carry on, to face the trial, and to make it out victorious on the other side. Amen? He's faithful.
I'm delighted that you're here. Many are traveling and on the roads today, and I'm glad that uh, you have made it a priority to be in the house of the Lord. Preachers sometimes get these senses. We get these impressions. Sometimes we say we get these leadings. And uh, sometimes when you get up to preach, you just have a feeling this is going to be a really good day. Uh, th- this is The audience is where they need to be. I'm where I need to be. And this is going to be a great time in the Lord. And sometimes you get up and you say, oh, this is going to be work today. <laughs> and I just have a sense, I'm just being honest with you, that, that it's, it's going to be a little bit of work today. Uh, I, I don't know where you're at and I, I don't know what you're feeling today, but it feels like Tennessee played Alabama yesterday in this room. <laughs> this room. So what, what I want you to do is this. I, I want you to stand and I want you to smile. Smile, okay? I want you to smile like you did when you were single and looking. <laughs> and I want you to do a little mingling. Mingle like you're single and tell somebody, the Lord has something for you today if you'll receive it. I hope that doesn't hurt anybody's marriage today. If you end up in divorce court, don't blame it on me. I was already in trouble before you started today. And I want to talk to somebody here today who's going through a difficult place in life. I want to talk to somebody who doesn't know what to do. Maybe you're in a place, you're in a situation, and you just don't know what you ought to be doing right now. You have no clue of what the next step is. Maybe you have a daughter, a uh, son, and they have just decided they're 19, they're going to live their life the way they want to live it, uh, and, and you pray for them, but, but you sense this powerlessness to really do anything, and you don't know what to do. They've made up their mind, and you seem like you're at a loss to know how to address the situation. Maybe you're in a marriage, and that spouse of yours has said, it's over, I, I'm finished, uh, there's somebody else, and, and you're sitting there, and you want desperately for that marriage to work, and you just don't know what to do in this situation. Maybe your husband lost his job, and you live week to week, and that's at least 50% of your income that's gone, and you got bills coming in this week, and again, you, you don't know, you don't have a clue of what to do. You know, in the book of Hosea, Hosea talked about Israel having their way hedged up, and whatever way they turned, God had hedged up their way so that they could not get out of the place they were in. And I think of Moses as he leads the children of Israel uh, out of e Egyptian bondage. And there he is facing a sea on one side, mountains on the other two, and an army coming up behind him. And he didn't know what to do. And there are days in your life when you don't know what to do. And I want to give you some things in the Bible. And if you're looking for a profound sermon, you came to the wrong place today. I just want to give you a Four very simple things that the Bible says that you ought to think about doing when you don't know what to do. If there isn't a clue of what my next step is, if I don't understand my situation, if I don't know, if I don't have the wisdom, if I don't have the power, what should you do when you don't know what to do? First thing I think I would tell you is this. The Bible says when you don't know what to do, when I don't know what to do, we ought to pray. We ought to pray. Look at of uh, Philippians chapter 4, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. When you don't know what to do 
in everything, pray. And everything are those times when you think you know what to do and the times when you don't have a clue of what you should be doing. But in everything, the Bible says, pray. If you don't know anything else to do, you can pray. Prayer is a powerful thing. It will relieve anxiety. It will help with your anxiety. And prayer is a powerful thing. Again, the Bible says, The prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much, much, says James chapter 5. You read your Bible, the Bible says that prayer can heal the sick. Prayer can close the mouths of the lions. Prayer can divide the waters. Prayer can deliver you from the fiery furnace. Prayer can save a city. Prayer can stop it from raining, and prayer can make it start raining again. Prayer can raise the dead. Prayer can do anything that God can do, and God can do anything. You need to begin to pray. It will raise your hopes. I like Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11, where God says to Israel, he says, and concerning the works of my hands, you command me. And that's a mighty aggressive statement that God says. He said, what you want me to do with my hands, command me. Tell me what you want me to do. And again, the prayer of a righteous person availeth much, makes a lot of things happen. So when you don't know what else to do, the best thing you can do is begin to pray because God can fix it, God can do it, and prayer moves the hand that moves the universe. Pray when you don't know what to do. Secondly, when you don't know what to do, be thankful Worship God. Be thankful. There was a place in the Bible in Acts chapter, I think, 22, where Paul and Silas, many of you would know this story, they're beaten up, and the Bible says that they were severely flogged. Severely flogged. Uh, Flogging, many people died because they were flogged. Sometimes they would take a stick. There were different kinds of flogging. Sometimes it was with a whip where they would put... uh, glass and embedded metal into the, into the whip so when they hit you it would tear your flesh and it would really tear you to shreds and it says that Paul and Silas were severely flogged, just not flogged but beaten maybe to the point of death and they need to go to the emergency room, they need medical attention but instead the Bible says that after they were flogged severely they were taken to the jail, they were thrown into the inner cell, the dark damp place where you wouldn't want to go if you had any chance of having an infection and again their backs were ripped to shreds and not only were they thrown in the cell but it says their feet were put in the stocks. So there they are in great need of medical attention, uh, their feet confined, laying on a rocks floor or a dirt floor. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 22 that even when they were there, they began to pray, or they began to pray and sing hymns unto God. They began to sing hymns unto God. Now, what were they doing? Paul was practicing what he preached because in 1 Thessalonians he says uh, uh, that uh, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you and I. So in every place when you don't know what to do and when you don't know what to do, raise your voice and give thanks to God in that situation. Now, what does he mean by give thanks? And you could say, well, he's saying whatever situation we're in, we ought to look for the silver lining. And I think that's true in one degree. You and I should look for the silver lining in our situation because it could always be worse. I mean, you look at your situation, 
And maybe you lost your job on Monday, and your daughter ran off with a musician on Tuesday. And Wednesday, uh, you fall and you break about every bone in your body. And Thursday, you get Ebola down at Ballard Healthcare. And Friday, the doctor says it's not looking so good. You ought to be able to thank God for something in that situation. At least you're not married to Charlie Sheen or one of those Kardashians. That could have been worse. So you ought to be able to find the silver lining in your situation, and that's true. I, mean, I look at my life sometimes, and, and I remember a guy telling a story so forcefully uh, in a sermon that, that it has just been embedded in my heart. He told about his father, who was an immigrant, and came to New York, and he had five or six kids, and he was a day laborer. And every day he would go out, and, and he would uh, get a job, and then he would buy food on the way home, and when he would come home, uh, there sat his family at the table waiting for the food that he brought home. But he went out, he said his grandfather went out and uh, could not find a job. There was no food in the house and he walked through the door and there sat his children and he had nothing to give them to eat and he went right to the bedroom and began to cry out to God to help him. And, and I think about that and often when I, I have things that I'm not happy about, it, 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 it's, it, when you think about thanking God, do I have food to give my children tonight? Is there something that I can give my children? I mean, for me, that, that begins, that, that's the silver lining in, in, in the cloud that has come into my life. And so there is always a silver lining. But I think that Paul would even go beyond that and say, we ought to be thankful for the silver linings, that's true. But we ought to also be thankful for the eternal realities that are ours because of Christ Jesus that cannot be taken from us regardless of whatever life throws at us. I mean, let me give you some. One of those things that can't be taken from you, the Bible says, is that Jesus loves you. And regardless of whatever is happening in your life, regardless of how bad it is, know that Jesus loves you. Romans chapter 8 says that death nor life can't remove the love that God has for us. Neither height nor depth can remove the love that Jesus Christ has for us. You're loved by Jesus Christ. And not only that, Jesus Christ has forgiven you if you are a child of God, and that can't be taken from you. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. That is a reality that is true of yours that can't be taken away if you'll have faith in Jesus Christ and walk with him. Not only that, he has forgiven us. Not only has he loved us, he has prepared a place for us in heaven for us to come after we are finished on this earth. And not only that, he's still king. Regardless of whatever is shaking, regardless of whatever the waves are doing in this universe, regardless of whatever the kings are doing and the congress are doing, whatever the economy is doing, Jesus Christ is still king and I can rest well knowing that. You got to be thankful. You got to be thankful in everything, good or bad, give thanks. Then, thirdly, not only can we pray, not only can we give thanks, but we can help somebody else. We can help somebody. You know, there's that great story, that great account in the life of Elisha in 1 Kings 17, where Elisha is in the middle of a famine. And the brook dries up and the Lord says, go to the widow's house, the widow in Karameth, I think, Kara something or another. And he says, go there, I've prepared a, a place for you there. And so he goes to the city and outside he sees the widow collecting sticks. And he goes up to this widow and he says, will you give me a drink of water? And to her credit, she goes to find him some water. And as she's walking away, he yells to her, Oh, yes, just like a man when his wife goes to the kitchen, he says, Could you also bring me some bread? You bring the water, bring the bread. And she says to him, Listen, I'm collecting sticks to build a fire 
because all we have is enough flour and oil for one more meal, and my son and I are going to eat it before we die. Again, this is the middle of a great famine, a great period of scarcity in the nation of, of Israel. And the prophet says to her, listen, if you'll give me what you have, if you'll give me your last meal, the Lord has said for me to tell you that the barrel of flour will never run out and the jar of oil will never run dry until the famine comes to an end. And to her credit, she did that for him. Now, here's the point. There's many points there. But the point is that, is that even if you don't have much, you can do something for somebody else. Somebody else can be ministered to you even when you feel the need to be ministered to. In fact, look at Hebrews chapter 13. It says, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, look at that, daily, daily, you and I are to be exhorting one another. Now, exhort means to call to your side. And so if you think about hikers, in, in their day they would be walking roads together, but if you think about hiking, to exhort is when you're down the trail a little bit, and people have fallen behind, exhort is to turn around and encourage them and to call them to your side and say, come on, you can make it. It's just a little bit longer to this summit. You'll be okay. Come on. Come on up. Catch up. That's what it means to exhort. And the Bible says that daily. Now, it doesn't say whether it's a good day or a bad day for you. It doesn't say whether it's a sunny day or a cloudy day for you. It doesn't say whether it's a day where you're in pain or a day when you're feeling pretty good. It doesn't say what kind of day, but it says daily be an encouragement to others that are in the Christian walk and even more than the Christian walk, in the human walk. Encourage them. Bless them. And you and I can do that. I read a psychiatrist uh, many years ago. He wrote an article, and he said, uh, and he said this is common knowledge in the, uh, in the uh, field of psychiatry. He said, the single greatest thing that you and I can do if we feel depressed is to get in our car, drive across town, and do something for somebody else. The single greatest thing that we can do to lift the spirit of heaviness is to get our clothes on, get in our car, Go across town, visit somebody who's worse off than we are, or even maybe better off than we are. Go volunteer somewhere where, where, go help somebody. There's always something we can do for somebody else. There's always something we can do for somebody else. We can pray for them, and again, prayer is powerful. We can call, we can text, we can visit. There is always something that we can give back to others who are suffering, who are hurting. We can always help somebody. When you don't know what to do, pray. When you don't know what to do, lift your voice in thanksgiving to God for what you have, for the silver lining, yes, but for what Jesus Christ has done for you that life can't take away from you. When you don't know what else to do, turn around, look around, see some needs around you, and help somebody. Even if it's just laying in your bed because you're deathly sick, it's laying there and raising your voice and praying for others who are sick. You can do that. But fourthly, when you don't know what else to do, when I don't know what else to do, we can trust God to work things out in our life. We can trust God. We can wait upon the Lord. If you're sitting there and you don't know what else to do, you might as well just wait upon the Lord. You might as well say, Lord, I don't know what else to do, but I'm going to trust you to work this out now or to work it out later, or to work it out way later. But I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to depend on you in this moment. I always liked Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11 is a uh, chapter of people with great faith. And it's, it's uh, tales of victory. But then it gets down to verse 35. And it says, and it's still talking about all the wonderful things that happen in the lives of people with faith. 
And it says, women receive their dead raised to life again. But then there's a period, and it shifts gears. And it says, others, others of great faith, others who depended on God, others who had as much faith as the folks who are mentioned earlier in the chapter, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. What's that saying? It's saying that in the midst of situations where they did not know what to do, they were being tortured, they were being attacked, they were being hurt, their families were being destroyed. Even in the midst of that situation that they said, we're going to be, remain faithful to God, we're going to depend on God, because even if we die, We'll get a better resurrection out of this thing. God will answer our prayer now. He'll raise us up. He'll deliver us or he'll answer it after we die with a better resurrection because we have remained faithful to him. God will take care of you. And it may happen in this life or it will happen in the next life. But in either case, even when you're on your deathbed, even when the doctors say there is no hope, you can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was thinking of the Exodus. I've been reading in the Old Testament lately. And one of the things that happens when the children of Israel leave Egypt, they rebel against God, they worship the golden calf, they bow down to the golden calf while Moses is on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. And because of that and, and other things that they did, God said, no one who was in Egypt, except for two guys, no one who was in Egypt and left will enter into the promised land that I have for the people. The whole generation will be destroyed. Only two guys who left Egypt will make it into the promised land. And the two men were Joshua and Caleb. They were given that privilege because uh, they were part of the constituency of 12 tribes that were sent out to spy out the land and 10 uh, of the 12 came back with a bad report and they essentially said God said that he'd give it to us but we don't think we can take it so they had a lack of faith but Joshua and Caleb said let's take it the Lord has given it to us let's go get it we can have faith in God and so because they had faith in that situation God said you too will be the only two that make it into the promised land of those who left Egypt but what is interesting, if you just think about it, is, is that that's not entirely true. That's not entirely true. Because there were two other men who actually were in Egypt that made it to the promised land. There was Joshua and Caleb, but there was a third guy who made it, and his name was Joseph. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that when Joseph was on his deathbed, he told those around him, now when you make it to the promised land, you be sure to take my bones with you. Don't you leave me in Egypt. I may not make it down there while I'm alive, but I'm going to make it when I'm dead. And so he gave instructions concerning his bones. And then in Exodus chapter 13 verse 9, we're told that Moses remembered that and he remembered what about the bones of Joseph, and he said, God will surely visit you. In other words, God's going to do something bad to you. Uh, so you need it, to carry the bones of Joseph into the promised land. They need to make it into the promised land. Don't mess with God. He was a friend of Joseph. Uh, or don't mess with Joseph. He was a friend of God. And so Joseph was really the third guy who made it to the promised land. And he was a guy who, again, he didn't make it alive, but he made it when he was dead. He said, I may not make it in while I'm breathing, but I'll make it in uh, eventually. Even if I'm dead, I'm going to the promised land. But then there was a fourth guy who also made it into the promised land, and his name was Moses. Now you say, hold up, we know our Bible. 
We know that God said to Moses when he sinned at Horeb, you will not enter into the promised land. And we know that when Moses died, the angel came and took his body and buried it in an undisclosed place so the Egyptians wouldn't make a shrine to him. But 1,300 years later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up the mountain to what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And there they heard from the Lord, Lord, and the Lord glorified Jesus in their midst. And the Bible says that in that scene, Moses and Elijah came down to the mount, which was in the promised land, and saw Jesus and Peter and James and John and had a conversation with them. Now, Moses, 1,300 years after he died, finally made it to the promised land. And I think it was worth the wait because he got to show up when Jesus showed up. He got to show up when Jesus was being glorified. I think it was almost worth the wait for Moses. What I'm saying to you is this. It's great to have faith that God will do something now. That's wonderful. But even greater faith is to say, if I don't see it in my lifetime, it'll happen Years after I die. It may not happen now. I may not live to see it. But I'll know what happened on the other side. I wonder if there's some prayers you've been praying for your family. And, and, and maybe you look at your life and say, I don't have long to live. I mean, I don't know how many years I've got to live. But you're still praying and you're believing the Lord that it may happen before you die or it may happen 20 years after you die. But I have faith that in a situation that I don't know how to get out of, that God will work this out for me. I wonder if you've got some kingdom dreams. I wonder if God has given you a vision of something in this life that he wants you to work on. Something he wants you to accomplish. And your prayer and your faith is this. Lord, I'm going to work at this. And when it seems like it's not coming to pass, when it seems like it's not going to happen, I'm still going to trust you. It may be that I see it from the portals of heaven. It may happen long after I die, but I'm going to work for it because I have faith that you'll bring it about even on my deathbed, even when they say you've got hours to live. I still believe you'll bring that vision about after I've gone to be with you. I wonder if you have faith in that situation. Faith to depend on God. Whenever you don't know what to do, when you don't have an answer, you can trust that God has an answer and that if you've entrusted your life to him, you can depend on him. You can always pray. You can always worship. You can always be thankful. You can always help somebody else. You can always trust God to bring you through, to bring to pass what he has said that he would bring to pass in your life. Stand with me, will you? There's a place in 1 Peter chapter 5, if you'll put it on the board. The Bible says this, look at the last line, that we can cast all our care on him for he cares for you. Now Peter's writing to people that didn't know what to do. He's writing to people who are persecuted, who are hurting, who are in dire straits. And he said when you're in those places, you need to cast all your care on on him. You need to pray. You need to trust him. You need to be thankful for what he's going to bring about in your life. You need to be thankful for how he's using you. He says, cast all your care on him. But look at the prerequisite. Put it up again, if you will. How do you cast all your care on him? Look at the first part. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and in due time he may exalt you. That, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care on him for he cares for you. How do you cast all your care on him? You simply humble yourself. And you bow down and you say, Lord, I don't have the answers, but you're the one with the mighty hand. You have the answers. I don't have the power, but you have a mighty hand. You have the power. I can't make a way, but I believe you're the one with the mighty hand. You can make a way in this situation. And I'm humbling myself. I'm saying I don't have the answer. I don't have the power. I don't have the ability. 
but I am humbling myself under you. And Peter says, if you'll do that, that'll be like taking all your cares and casting them on him. You'll be casting them on him. Cast them on him as you humble yourself under his mighty hand. Some of you don't know what to do today. And we all get into a place sooner or later in life when we just don't know what to do. I want to suggest to you that you can kneel at an altar of prayer today. That'd be a good start. You can pray. And you can humble yourself under him and say, I don't have the answers. But I'm putting faith and trust in you. I believe that you do. I believe that you'll see me through. And God can help you in the place you're in. He is able to help those who are being tempted. He's able to help those who are being tried. He is able to help you today if you'll reach out and take it. Now, you've got to come get it. You've got to take it. Just as they did with the promised land, they had to go get it. And you need to come get the promises of God in your life. You need to come get him. Don't stand there. Come get him today. Reach out to him. Do something that shows him that you really want him in your life. And he can help you when you don't know what to do. Let's sing together. You come. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling you. Have you come to the end of yourself?
Father, we love you. God, we know that you have been faithful in our lives. God, when there are times that we feel like we cannot go on, God, when we have been brought down low, 
to the point of destruction, to the bottom of the barrel, God, then we cannot seem to find the light. God, sometimes we just have to trust that you are still there. Even when we may not be able to feel you, we may not be able to hear you. God, you are still there and you are still faithful in our lives. So God, we stand on your word and we stand on your promises. And God, we trust the spirit that lives inside of us. Father, as we continue in an attitude of prayer from this place, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us. God, that you would show us your promises. And God, that we might lean on those in our terrible time of trial. Give us understanding. In your name we pray. Amen.